We're going to cover today how to build useful Airtable dashboards. Of course, Airtable has the ability to put on a bunch of graphs and you could put numbers and you could put Kanbans. You can build a, you can build a dashboard with a lot of stuff and you can clutter it with pretty pictures. Today, I'm going to focus on how do you actually make these pretty pictures useful to you as a business owner. So we are going to cover how do you choose the right KPIs. And, uh, and this is based on the system archetype. We'll go over that. Um, and there's like different, uh, different types. So I have some thoughts on how we think about whether you should choose a, uh, a pie chart, a line graph, a bar graph. Um, so yeah, that is, that is today. Hope you get some value from this video. Um, mostly these documents are internal for our team, but, uh, I figured other people would find some value from it as well. So. The question is, if you're familiar with Airtable, which if you're watching this, hopefully you are, uh, why would you not just manage through tables alone? Well, we actually, we used to do this um, and we, we do start off with creating the tables and making sure that our clients understands the Airtable table structure that we've chosen. It needs to first make sense there, but why not just stay there? Uh, the biggest thing is it's uh, less, dis less distracting for a team member either you to see a dashboard or somebody else to just see that a simple interface, right? So it's fewer clicks to, the, to do the management that they need to do because of course you can combine information from different tables and you can put, you know, graphs and things with the tables and with a Kanban on one page. Whereas if you manage through tables, you have to have uh, like a, 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 a grid with a Kanban and they're like different clicks to get to each one or to manage different tables, you have to click around on the tables. Um, another one is fewer errors. So if there's fewer things to click on, there's fewer things to screw up, which is nice. And the other one is that, uh, you know, like you can tell a better story with the data. So you can show a KPI, like total number of calls booked this month as a number, rather than having someone scroll through table and just see like a, a bunch of records. So it does uh, allow you to tell a better story as well so how do you do this this is how we do it anyways uh the first thing we do is we'll we'll hop on a, a couple of calls with the client depending on how large their business is and we we do what we call a company brain so we use a tool it's a flow chart right so we use a tool called lucid chart i will show you here i don't have any vested interest in lucid chart but you know we we open this up uh and we have a bunch of templates so like this for example is our is our template. So we go through and we make a bunch of flow charts. This, for example, is what our onboarding template looks like. So what we generally do is if we working with a business that we've worked with a lot of businesses like that before, we have templates built out where we're like, yeah, your system probably looks like this, right? And, uh, you know, we can see how far off their existing process is. Uh, if you're starting from scratch on your own, I would just use Lucid Chart. You can use Miro, you can use uh, something else, but anyway, that is the first thing that we do. Uh, uh, okay, onto that later. So that is that is step one. Um, we then identify the system archetype. So what we found is that for uh, for any given business that we work with, they have a bunch of systems. But even if we've never seen that exact business model before, we can slot the system into several archetypes. So is it a pipeline where tasks must be completed in a specific order? Is it a, uh, a bunch of tasks where they can be completed in any order? Is it uh, a funnel where there's lots of items that come in at the top and, and things get disqualified or drop off as you go further? Or is it what we call a matching funnel? Um, and we'll go over those types in a second, but we, we slot the system into archetypes figure this out and then I will show you in a second our system archetype SOP because we we do find that the KPIs that are available to measure for any given system archetype are the same. So by doing so, I'll show you our guide here in a second. Um, you can uh, you can do that. The only the only design you have to do after this point is choosing of all the KPIs you could measure, choosing the right KPI to measure. So um, that is high level that's that uh the next thing we do is we build out an organizational chart an org chart um and the reason we do that is we want to find out who are all the people that are involved in managing this process so you might have the ceo of the company who cares about the high level metrics for the company as a whole 
You might have a sales director who only cares about sales and marketing metrics. And you're going to have, of course, you're going to have individual freelancers or people on your team who have their own KPIs and maybe are being compensated based on the amount of productivity they put out. So that is uh, what we do. So we, we do what we call a, or what is called a jobs to be done analysis. And that jobs to be done analysis basically is uh, what is this person for each person in your organization? What do they need to do? So an editor, a video editor has a KPI potentially of the number of videos they did last week or the week before, because maybe they're being paid based on that metric. They need to also tell the system or, or update your system in terms of which videos have been edited. Uh, they need to fix the videos that, that have problems with them. Um, so what we do is we, we, we do uh, an analysis like this. Okay. Then we do what's called jobs to be done. Jobs to be done is a, uh, a, a methodology they use in Silicon Valley, right? So this is for every, every member of your team. You can do this analysis as well. Um, we think about inputs and KPIs, right? Uh, or like maybe outputs as well. It doesn't have to be a, a KPI necessarily, but what information do they need to, to be visualized? What information do they need to tell the system? And, uh, and what are their, their performance metrics, right? So for each one of these, we then pick the right interface elements. I'm going to tell you how to do this. I'm just giving you an overview here. And, and then we create an interface for each person. So if you have an editor named Susan, for example, uh, we would make, it would say, okay, what are, the, what are the KPIs for Susan? What are the pieces of information that Susan needs to do her job well? And then what does Susan need to, to manage in terms of the system? So maybe it would be a Kanban um, with a line graph over top or a bar graph over top showing the average number of videos produced by Susan every single week. Um, and the number of videos in terms of a KPI could be the number of videos or the percentage of videos submitted on time versus the ones that were late or the percentage of videos that passed quality assurance on the first try correctly, right? So we do that. Um, and then what we do as well, and uh, you know, hopefully you've done your job correctly and, and you, you don't need us, but what we do is then we, we kind of instruct the client like, hey, when, when this graph is going down, that, like, that means you should do this thing. And we typically do these on regular ops calls with a client, but you can do this analysis yourself as well. What you want to do is plan out KPIs. I'll show you how to do this in a second. But plan out KPIs that actually tell you how to behave differently or tell you useful information about your business. So, um, yeah. And so how do you do that? So uh, let's look at how do you pick KPIs. So what our philosophy is every single role in your business, you need both a leading indicator and a lagging indicator. So uh how do you, you choose based on the system archetype. Um, and I'll go over that in a second. But every role in your business should have at least two KPIs. So a performance KPI. So let's pick a, a video editor, for example. A video editor, you want your video editor to have videos that get a lot of views. Or uh, the, the video should book a lot of calls. Or whatever your, your metric is. So this is like more like the business metric that's a longer term linked to profit uh, or, or, or client's uh, retention type thing. And then you have a leading KPI that if you do this one leading KPI well, the lagging KPI should follow. So for example, if you do video editing or if you have a video editing agency, um, your leading KPI may be uh, what we call either speed focused or quality focused. So for example, you probably don't care if your video editor turns around a video in five minutes or 30 seconds. You probably care a lot more that they are fast enough, but what you really care about is the quality of the edit. So you want them to be on time, but early doesn't really help, you know, very much. Faster is not better. You want them to be quality focused. So you want the video to have few quality mistakes in terms of typos. You want the transitions to all be done well. You want the background music to be chosen appropriately, okay. things like that. So, so video is a quality focused um, uh, activity, whereas speed. So if you go to a restaurant um, or you're, you're doing inbox management for cold email, for example, you want fast responses. You don't care that the quality is not exactly perfect. What you really want 
is really, really fast and it has to be kind of good enough. So um, that would be like going to a restaurant. You want to you wanna, uh, do like order speed. You don't care if you do cold email inbox management. Um, you don't need, we have a, the cleaners are here. So um, if you do cold email inbox management, you don't need to do quality control on every single response. You just want them to respond quickly because if you wait 12 or 24 hours between responses, your odds of getting that, that call book for that lead are, are, are gonna go down. So performance KPI, like a lagging KPI and a leading KPI. So you wanna pick, um, you wanna pick one of each. So for example, I have some examples here. You can take a look at these. You could pause the video and do that. So. Um, should you choose speed or quality, right? Basically, you're either focused on speed or you're focused on quality. Um, and you can imagine what speed metrics would be versus quality metrics. So speed metrics just, you know, speed of response. Quality is a percentage of, of time where the thing passes quality control in the first time, something like that, right? So, um, so our code development process, for example, uh, we care more about the code being done correctly as, as long as it's done on time than we do about rushing our development process. So we want them to be on time. We don't care that they're, uh, you know, doing things within five minutes. Whereas bug fixes, we actually do want the bug fixes to be, do to be done. Well, our, our KPI for speed for bug fixes is much more aggressive because uh, we don't want a bug to be, you know, sitting there for a week, right? Whereas if it takes a week to develop a feature, that's kind of okay with me, okay? So you can pause the video and, and read through this uh, if you want some more detail. So the other one too is that KPIs need to be fully controllable. So the, the couple of thoughts that we, we always keep in mind, um, if the process has a series of steps that include possible time delays, you want to try to isolate the steps that are under uh, the client's control, in, the, in this case, your control. So for example, um, we have a client that's a hiring firm, like a recruiting firm. And uh, so a metric like time to make an offer is not the greatest metric. It's, it's maybe like, okay, but really that time to make an offer is dependent on other, other, you know, other things stacking up. And, and so you'd really want to first start with measuring subcomponents of that, right? Because what happens if time to make an offer, you want to make an offer, you're ready to go. And the candidate says, hey, I'm, I'm really, I'm going on a holiday for like a, a week. Can we do our interview when I get back? all of a sudden your time to make an offer is, is gonna go down. And so all of a sudden it's gonna look like your, your KPI is underperforming where it's really not. So you, you, you wanna try to, like what we think about in this case is uh, something that is fully under, under your control internally as your team, like time to process an initial application and decide if somebody should, should get an interview or be rejected. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing to consider is that uh, if there's external factors that, that could affect the metric, you want to try to control for these. So for example, right, we think about this for our, for our CRM uh, we, that we built. Uh, if you have a sales process, the prospect show rate is obviously like a, the show rate on a call is a very common metric, but you really want to control for whether it's the first call or the second call or a, a third call because the, the, you'd, you'd expect that if it's a second call with a prospect, they'd be more likely to show than if it's a first call, depending on, on the market. So it, 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 what we do, for example, is we measure prospect show rate on the first call, but not on the second call. Okay, so you do wanna control for these factors. Um, and then the other one too, is that we wanna group by factors that tell a useful story. So, so for example, I've hinted at like the, the pass percentage, the QA pass percentage on the first submission. It's like, great, we've qualified for first submission, but as a whole company, it's less informative because if we, if we think about this uh, for a video editing agency or whatever, um, that only makes sense if you have the same team o over time, right? If you hire a new person, you would expect your, your aggregate quality percentage to go down. And so what you really want to do is group by like the editor or group by the developer or the writer or whoever it is you have. So we think about grouping as well. All right. Uh, next, next point to consider is picking the right time granularity. So uh, obviously you want to track often enough that the metric is responsive. So 
close rate per year is like probably not a metric that you want to track. Um, but you 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 want to track uh, with a long enough time frame that your your data is not noisy. So if you book if you book you know five sales calls per week, doing your close rate per week is probably not the best metric because you just don't if you just don't close one or two your your data is going to your your um your average per week is going to just go like this right it's not going to tell you a useful story so maybe you want to do it by by month something like this right so you want to pick uh, uh the happy medium there and you can of course pause this uh right um so uh, you can imagine the same case for something like a video editing agency etc so here's what we think about and you can read through these bullet points here. So uh, how many times does the event occur? So I think for like, if I think about this, probably updating the metric after, you know, 10 to 50 occurrences, roughly on the low end, um, it is like, it sounds fair to me. Uh, another one too is you want, you probably want like round time periods. So something like what's the average close rate over the last 19.75 days even if that you we work that out and that's like the uh, you know the, that's a decent time frame it's just it's not a it's not a round time frame so it just it sounds weird uh another one too is that if you're tracking time durations for something that takes that could take anywhere between like a few hours and a couple of days you you probably don't want to track in fractions of a day because let's say your thing, your activity actually takes like 30 minutes to do on average or a couple of hours to do on average. If I get that, if, if that is assigned at 9 p.m. on one day and then the next morning at 7 a.m. someone starts working on it, it's going to look like it took several hours, like many, many, many hours longer. So what we normally would do is make the, the metric kind of fuzzy. So track on like a round number of days. So less than a day, one to two days, two to three days, et cetera. You can use like round functions in, in Airtable for this or any other software. Um, and then if there's if there's heavy seasonality or if it changes like periodically, you you may want to track by week. So for example, emails, uh, oh, like calls, calls booked per day, right? So calls booked per day, you would expect to go to next to zero on weekends if you're not sending emails on weekends. Uh, because people are not going to be on the, the, there during weekends. Um, there, we have some clients where their their business is very very seasonal, so it makes more sense to compare December to December, January to January, uh, and so on and so forth. Because there's a, a lot more similarities between the Januaries and the Marches and things like that than there are between January and February and March, right? So you have this like if there's a natural cycle either in the week uh, or the day or the the year. You do want to account for that. So that's that. And then the other one to consider is that different people in the business may, may want the same metric with different time slicing. So for example, uh, if you have a cold email agency and you're measuring um, the number of calls booked per day is a great inbox manager metric. Like it, it means that if you're getting like a number of calls booked per day, it means that your inbox manager is like very responsive in that day right but as a as a business owner let's say you weren't the direct manager of your inbox manager let's say you were the owner of the business you would probably want to know things like how many calls are you booking per week or per month because that tells you your overall cash flow so keep in mind that you you may have the same metric but just slice different ways for different time periods okay so we we want to we, we we've got we've got the kpi let's say what kind of graph should you use? Should you use a bar graph, a pie chart? Uh, like, should you use filters or not, et cetera? So um, how do we think about this? Well, uh, so filters, right? So Airtable filters, um, should, you, should you use them or not? So to me, they have a couple of purposes. One is to group or cluster the data so that it has the same purpose as a, as a graph, right? Um, and then the other one is to restrict time periods to say only show the last week of the last month or, or whatever else. Um, let's say you implement some kind of like uh, some kind of change to your marketing strategy or some kind of policy and you want to see if it affected the, the data before and after that, you could restrict the time periods and go the, the period before and the period after. 
Um, so the, 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 the weird thing with filters is if you have multiple time uh, filters, it doesn't, you can't say like filter this one by client and then have this filter update and only show the campaigns, for example, for that client. The way around this is you make the primary key in the table a, a formula field and combine the two together and, and that you can solve it that way. Um, so that is that number fields. So number fields are like this where it's active clients, this, this, like this kind of stuff. Uh, these are awesome for showing the KPI or some kind of data in a very high level way, like the current, the current number. The current number of bugs open, the current uh, number of videos left to be processed, um, the number done this week, the number done this month, that kind of thing. Um, because they just take up visually less space than a, a graph, which is cool. So that is, uh, that's why you would choose this. Okay, a graph. Um, so this is an example of a, a line graph, by the way. Uh, when do you use, okay, so, so sh what kind of graph should you use? So should you use a grid, but not a graph? You should do this. You should use a grid, like a table. Uh, if you have a situation like this where there's a lot of items, so this is a this is a bar graph that I I did as an example um, or a setup for a bar graph where it's a list of campaigns. So there's lots of them here. Really doesn't make sense to to do to do a graph because your graph is going to be extremely cluttered. So if you have a large number of records um, and you would otherwise choose a, a, a some kind of graph or a pie chart. Uh, you shouldn't do that. Just use a graph, right? Um, and it could also be the case where you don't have a large number of records now, but over the normal course of running the business, you'd expect that number to grow like on a on a on a day to day or week by week basis. Then you would go uh, grid and not not graph like this. All right. Um, if if it's a case of a line graph, like like line graphs are typically used for uh, time graphing. Um, if you have 2D data points for a line graph, you just change the time period from every day to every week to every, you know, every month, something like that. So uh, bar graph, when do you use a bar graph? This is a bar graph. Um, I really, so one of the things, if you're using Airtable specifically, um, the, the, you can't do stacked line graphs in Airtable where it like fills, you know, the, each section of it, like you can in Google Sheets. Um, so, so if you have a stacked graph, I would use a stacked bar graph instead, or like a group line graph like this, it looks better. Um, and if you are not graphing things over time, right? So these are the pipeline stages. Like this is, you know, every stage of, of a, of a sequence and the total amount of time is spent in that, in that step. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense to graph this as a line graph. And the reason for that is because a line graph like if we had zero time in, in these two steps uh, here, the line graph would have a line from here to there. And we've, we've actually done this before to see what it would look like. And so a line graph makes it, a, like it, it interpolates or like it looks as if the, the value in the middle is an interpolation of the two endpoints. And so this is, uh, it's just far more accurate to do a bar graph in this situation. So. Um, I actually prefer a, a bar graph. I think it looks better, frankly, in, in Airtable. That's just my, my personal opinion. Um, and because of the colors. So when do you use a line graph, right? So if, if of course, our client doesn't like the look of the bar graph, we can switch to the line graph. Um, or if you want to show correlations between two variables, like, uh, you know, some, uh, the, the number of emails sent on one axis versus the number of calls booked. So if you, it, you, you, the line graph is kind of helpful for showing like if there's a correlation between these two two values or graphing things over time where you want to, uh, you just prefer to have a, a line graph and you you can you can show like the interpolation there. So, um, and, and so the other thing is that these have to be true. So when you can infer the performance between two points as the actual like the, 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 on the line somehow, of course that is there. And if you don't need to stack or group, then a line graph is perfectly acceptable. Um, pie chart. So, uh, this is like for, uh, you know, for a, a CRM sales system, you could track something like the total calls closed, but this is kind of a vanity. Like you don't care about total calls closed. You care about total calls and then the, the deal 
state after a few calls, right? Uh, one or call, one call, two calls. Um, so we would actually use like the close percentage, and which could be a, a, an individual number field or the uh, like a pie chart of the deal stage broken down into uh, states, whether it's like still in development or closed or contract sense or whatever else. So we would normally, so if you think about close, it could be part of a pie chart or it could be a, a number of field on its own. If you find yourself having a bunch of numbers that all have percentages in them, you could probably just combine them into a pie chart. So uh, the CRM thing is, is a great example of that. All right. And then when should you use different view types? So I have a whole other SOP on that. Um, I have a whole other video on that. I'll link that video, whatever, somewhere like over here or over uh, somewhere in this, whatever, you'll figure it out. So um, I have another video on, on this. You can have a grid or a Kanban or something actually directly on the Airtable interface, which is what we would really like to do because back to the whole conversation about roles, you could have like your video editor having the Kanban that they need to manage the system as well as their KPIs at the top as well in one place. So really, really handy. I will link to that other video here somewhere. So wanted to show you bad examples of interfaces, right? So this is a pie chart that we put together to show you that this is a bad idea. All right, so the pie chart is kind of, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, whatever you just tell. Um, Basically, if, if, if you have things where it would normally increase as a, as, a percent, as, a, as a function of the normal running of the business, it's a bad idea um, because this pie chart would just get segmented and segmented and segmented, and it doesn't tell a story anymore if there's a thousand you know, sections to the, the pie chart, which this will get to very, very soon. Um, so there's plenty of bad examples of interfaces that you can put together. Um, Anyways, uh, the last piece is how do you share, how do you make an interface client specific? Uh, it is this process. So pretty simple, that is all that. Um, let me show you the Airtable interface guide. So system architects, actually, you know what? No, nah, we'll do a separate video on that. Never mind. Hopefully you found this guide useful. Um, and yeah. Uh, DM me or whatever. So yeah, send me a, a, a DM on Twitter if you have any questions. You could comment below as well. Do pretty much whatever you want. Peace.